Welcome to another webinar from Scott, Smart Community Tourism webinar series. We are with you with volume number 24 today uh, on mountain tourism and community development. And we are going to learn lessons from the Himalayas. Um, today, uh, we have um, five speakers. Uh, Dr. Lee is uh, the moderator and he will uh, direct the panel as well. Um, and in the beginning, I would like to ask uh, uh, the curator of Scott, Professor Jafari, uh, to give us uh, uh, a few words with uh, welcome remarks. Professor Jafari, floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning or good day to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you with us uh, on this very interesting, valuable subject. Uh, I don't want to make my introduction or welcome too long because you are not here to listen to me, but you are uh, here to listen to uh, an engaged discussion that we are going on the topic. Um, our webinar series is dealing with uh, neglected communities, neglected hosts, neglected small operators in the field of tourism. The large communities, large destinations, large countries, large everything is covered by most other webinars. So this is our efforts to uh, transfer intelligence, knowledge, know-how, uh, from fields of practice to the fields of practice and from the academia to the field of practice and share our views on this subject. The idea is to make life better for the host communities. The idea is to make uh, business better for small operators who mm -hmm. often do not know how to manage uh, their work and they receive little help. Uh, from local authorities or national authorities. Uh, so what, once more, once, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I will be with you throughout the discussion. And as needed, I will come back uh, uh, to the discussion and to the conclusion. Uh, thank you very much and uh, let's, let's go on. Evening. Thank you, Professor Jafari. And uh, I pass the floor to Dr. Lee uh, to direct us with today's uh, event. Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks for Dr. Jaffa Jaffrey and uh, Dr. Kazan. A uh, very warm greeting uh, from a very far away place from Japan, from Spain. My name is Chen Lee. I'm honored to be the uh, moderator service for you today discussion. Uh, I'd like to say a very good morning, uh, good afternoon, and a uh, very good evening to all of our audience here now. And I see from the screen here uh, now, and there are actually roughly about uh, 180 participants as we speak now. So we, uh, we were happy with so many audience from all over the world. Firstly, uh, we were uh, foremost, it's very, very important to let me start by sex, the organizers, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, for, uh, uh, who is the creator and uh, founding father of the uh, uh, Scott uh, uh, Initiative together with Professor uh, Morris from uh, Los uh, Carolina State University of the United States. And also, of course, from uh, 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 sex professor Kazan uh, uh, Wafatari uh, from uh, Asia Pacific University, Japan. Uh, with River uh, uh, and uh, with this uh, theme, we have able to uh, launch, uh, launch this uh, River important and uh, we will receive this uh, uh, Scott webinar series. Uh, it's titled Smart Community of Tourism. It, it will focus on uh, how we can make the community smart through the development of tourism. So today, uh, our topic is uh, mountain tourism and the community development uh, lesson from uh, Himalayas. Uh, as we know that uh, Himalayas as a uh, uh, unique uh, environment, 
and uh, uh, culture for our mountain tourism. Uh, it's developed uh, uh, data came back to the middle of the 20th century, uh, popularized after the George uh, uh, Mallory. It's uh, so the first time in 19, 1922. So mountain tourism de development can give adaptive uh, livelihood, livelihood for poverty uh, alleviation. So we were important. So um, uh, uh, developed so quickly. Mountain tourism development in Himalaya uh, must uh, support the local communities and the uh, indigenous people. Uh, it encourage Sherbas and the Tibetans and Sky. Uh, the purpose of the panel is, uh, of experts is to discuss topic related to uh, mountain tourism and to provide uh, experience based uh, insight and uh, suggestion for sustainable development of small communities through mountain tourism. So inter, uh, in order to address the issue of mountain tourism and the community development, in Himalaya, uh, as uh, as we not, uh, as we uh, noticed that mountain tourism in Himalaya uh, be, is being underrepresented uh, when compared with other international tourism uh, academic topic. So, uh, sex, uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey, that we are able to pick up this topic uh, as the theme uh, for today's discussion. But I also want sex uh, cousin. That's uh, of course it's uh, very important. Uh, can we can trust it our, uh, uh, our our message to the uh, 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 the remote uh, uh, community, uh, small villages. Uh, so it's my uh, it's my sex for uh, these two uh, founding uh, uh, professors of this initiative. So now uh, we have. Uh, 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 now we have uh, we were uh, 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 beautiful ladies and uh, gentle, uh, gentlemen and uh, or the panel uh, audience here uh, lines up for us uh, each and every one of you uh, is very important uh, uh, expert in the uh, uh, circle of mountain tourism of Himalayas. So uh, we will appreciate your uh, our five speakers that uh, your precious time that you are uh, sharing with us uh, in this uh, pandemic uh, crisis. So my personal thanks to each uh, and uh, every panel member of today, uh, Shenxin. Uh, so without further ado, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's go straight to our presentation part. Uh, we, were, uh, we have roughly uh, about uh, 18 minutes uh, left out of the uh, 10 minutes. So uh, we need to cover two parts. The first part maybe uh, is the round of uh, uh, presentations by uh, each one of speakers. So let's begin to look at and learn uh, who is going on when it's come to uh, uh, mountain tourism and uh, communities development in the spatial region. So uh, firstly, uh, and our first uh, uh, intervention uh, presentation will be Dr. Alu, uh, Alu Lama. So I will briefly introduce uh, uh, Dr. Alu Lama's situation. Uh, Dr. Alu Lama is the tourism specialist uh, at the International Center for uh, Integrated Mountain Tourism. It was also called ESIMUD. It's a uh, uh, we special uh, intergovernmental uh, organization. So uh, he has over uh, uh, 20, 20 years of experience of working in the field of sustainable tourism development, climate, ch uh, uh, climate change action and the government and the policy practice and a, a science uh, interface. Uh, Dr. Alu, uh, re Alu received her master's degree in applying science from uh, Lincoln University in New Zealand. Uh, 2010, and also a larger master degree in, uh, in environmental science from uh, Bangalore University in India in, uh, in uh, uh, 20 years ago. And in 2060, he got PhD degree in human geography uh, from a Junius uh, Maximilian University in Germany. He is current in, in engaged in promoting sustainable tourism in China, India, Bhutan, Pakistan, Nepal, 
Afghanistan and uh, Tajikistan, uh, piloting several climate resilience tourism initiative, climate resilience tourism entrepreneurship through uh, Tourism Plus uh, Innovation. It was what's called uh, the Tulovation uh, Hope and uh, uh, enhancing uh, climate service for building a resilience uh, tourism sector in uh, 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 Chitwan, uh, Lipo, and the uh, ticket uh, uh, great. Uh, Geishin from Green Tourism in Ladakh and, and uh, Nepal. He, she leads the uh, innovation, investment, in, and the entrepreneurship concept, uh, renovation energies, and uh, energy inf efficiency uh, capability for Hindu Kusin Himalaya initiative and the tourism pilot. So there are a lot of things I cannot read them as uh, one by one. So uh, our larger, at last, uh, very important that. Uh, uh, Dr. Alu Lama is the first uh, Lipolis citizen to receive the Humboldt, uh, Humboldt International Climate Protection Fellow from Germany. So the floor is yours, Dr. Alu Lama. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for this very elaborative introductions. Uh, uh, I'm very humbled uh, to be a part of this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to really uh, share our experiences in regards to, uh, you know, to contribute to this theme that is, uh, you know, mountain tourism and the Himalayan communities. Um, I am going to right now uh, upload my presentation. Is it visible? Okay. Yeah? Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, once again, a very good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants who's joining us uh, in this webinar or also listening us live. Um, uh, I'm Anu Kumari Lama, a tourism specialist at EC Mode. Um, uh, as Dr. Lee has already mentioned, EC Mode is an intergovernmental uh, learning and knowledge center um, established uh, to work for the uh, mountain people, like Professor Zakhli was saying, right, the most neglected and the most, uh, you know, impoverished uh, part of the region. So we are working in the far uh, mountain uh, regions of the Hindu Kush Himalaya. Uh, this, uh, the very precise reason why Isimot got established was perhaps what Zakhli, uh, Professor Zakhli has alluded again, is that, um, uh, and also which is very similar to, you know, the theme of this webinar is that, you know, back in the early um, 1980s, um, the whole uh, mountain uh, country or regions became quite an uh, important talking point, especially of, uh, of the, the Himalayan degradation theory. And so EC mode was established primarily with the concern of really addressing the sustainable mountain uh, development issues. But since then, uh, you know, over almost three and a half decades, uh, the whole uh, concept of sustainable mountain tourism development has changed quite dramatically. And so this presentation, um, I, I would like to really take you on a journey of our experience of promoting sustainable mountain tourism development in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. So I have structured my presentations in three uh, uh, specific uh, um, points. The first one is I will quickly uh, take you uh, or, or really bring to your attention as to, you know, what is the context and the concept of mountain tourism when we are talking about the Hindu Kush Himalaya. So this really helps us to understand the context uh, in which we are now talking about, um, especially the idea of sustainable mountain uh, tourism development. Then, um, uh, based on this background, so what do these concepts and contexts really mean for the for promoting sustainable mountain tourism, and especially in regards to the futures that we want to really look forward to? And this is very critical because primarily of the, like I've already mentioned, the kind of a changes that our region has experienced as well as our mountain communities. And this I want to really touch upon with this whole theme or the concept of the macro trends. Um, so in the light of this macro trend, then what is ACMO doing? Uh, how is it responding uh, to such uh, uh, trends? Um, this I will present it by showing three pilot works um, from three of our regional member countries, that is China, Bangladesh, and Nepal. 
So uh, for those who are joining us and new to this whole region, uh, let me quickly introduce what Hindukush Himalayan region is. Uh, this is one of the greatest mountain uh, systems in the world, uh, covering around 400, uh, 4 million square kilometer, uh, covering eight regional member countries, right from Afghanistan to Pakistan. Um, in addition to this whole, uh, you know, wonder of the, the larger landscape and the country that it represents, the most important value that's the, that this region brings to the global community is that it is the global assets providing a lot of ecosystem services upon which livelihoods as well as many other aspects of development is dependent. So it is almost 240 million people depend directly on this, um, 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 on this region, especially for their services and resources. 1.9 billion uh, who are residing at the downstream are dependent, indirectly dependent on these resources. It is also um, found that more than 35% of the global world population has also in, or de uh, depends indirectly on the uh, resources as well as the services. Now, how are we able to provide this kind of a value? So this really, the graph gives you an idea. So this is made possible primarily because of the various biodiversity riches that it harbors along with the sociocultural and also, we are, are aware of this term that, you know, our region is the water tower of Asia. Ten of the major Asian rivers, it originates in our region. And another term which is very popular and important for all of us who are engaged in a global environmental change issue is that Hindukus Himalayan region is also the third pole, known as the third pole of the world, primarily because it really has largest reserves of the ice outside the polar regions, and definitely the biodiversity hotspot is something. So all these really led us to think that, or us to realize that mountain really matters for Hindukus Himalayan region, uh, primarily because of the value and the benefits. So these values and benefits are both tangible as well as intangible. And when I have to be more specific, right from regulating to climate, as well as provisioning food, energy, water, cultural and biological diversity, or providing the cultural services like recreation, spiritual and aesthetic values, mountains really matters for the humanity and most prominently and important for our mountain communities. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, this, um, these slides really help us to understand that when it comes to the environmental and cultural riches, uh, the Hindukus Himalayan has the most important um, assets and resources. But on the flip side of it, uh, we are also mindful that this is also one of the most impo impoverished part of the world. Um, so poverty is quite, uh, you know, uh, one of the major challenges. And so the vision really pushed towards uh, trying to uh, address the, or bring the improved uh, livelihoods or well-being, uh, improved well-being among the communities. And this well-being, if you really uh, try to uh, realize and understand from the broader global assets and service point of view, the well-being is very much linked with the mountain ecosystem and the communities. And based on which the prosperity narrative, especially when we say tourism, its whole value is linked with economy, jobs, income. So the prosperity is very much linked with the well-being of the ecosystem and communities. Um, if, we, uh, um, uh, if we reflect on the kind of mountain tourism that is being promoted at, uh, in the Hindu Himalayan region, uh, there are different types as well as uh, the, the concepts, but what we need to understand is while all of these uh, types are very much promoted based around the concept of sustainability, there are significant overlaps. So, um, so with this background um, um, context and the concept, now um, if we are trying to understand now where does uh, sustainable mountain tourism stands? And what we have to really remember now is more than ever now, we are really standing at the threshold of a great transition that is going to um, really affect all the mountain communities and tourism. And when I say the transition, some of these are already happening and others are yet to be realized, which is going to bring a massive shift in the way we look at sustainable mountain tourism. And this I'm really talking about from the perspective of macro trends. So when I say macro trends, I have really divided this whole, uh, you know, the, the trend in, in three particular groups. 
Some of these trends are really creating a prospects and uh, in in the region, while others are really affecting us as issues. While others, again, uh, in the terms of opportunities. So when I say the prospects, definitely uh, until before the pandemic happened, obviously climate change has always been an overriding concern. But until before the COVID hit our region, uh, the the this region was very much the powerhouse of the growth, well, primarily because of the economic growth as well as tourism. So um, uh, in 2019, uh, we, uh, the, this whole Hindukus Himalayan region received almost like 190 million tourists, which crossed the entire, the, the borders across the Hindukus, uh, um, the Hindukus Himalayan region, creating millions of jobs, incomes and enterprise. But another interesting prospect that was really emerging in this context was also uh, you know, there was a, a, a very ma radical shift that was being experienced in the market as well as in the demographic context. So when I say market, um, uh, although Professor Lee has mentioned about, you know, the pretext for this webinar is the modern, the mountaineering that happened, but this was primarily the international market. But what we have to also realize from the prospects is that the regional and domestic market was growing rapidly and really providing a lot of businesses and jobs in our region. And definitely being one of the region with the young uh, population, the, uh, we are blessed with a you know, larger percentage of uh, working age population. So these are quite a important um, indicators that really had uh, you know, mountain communities be very much uh, um, uh, positive and looking forward to you know the prosperity that they could have achieved it but what happened is the issues right see the um the um uh, the climate change um and the pandemics are two of the most important uh, issues now our uh, regions are facing um so if we talk about the climate change uh, there's a lot that been talked, so I don't want to go into depth, but definitely we all are aware of these mountains are warming like anything. And so uh, the whole purpose of really Ishimoto advocating in the global platform through different fora or like this is also that we are really um, trying to uh, um, um, communicate to the world that we should limit our, our emissions uh, below 1.5 or at least 1.5 degree. But even in that case, this means that we are going to lose almost like 36% of the glaciers. And not to forget also, in addition to this, the, the changes in emissions, what is more worrisome and becoming quite a new normal are the increasing variabilities in climate, especially the extremes. So these are quite an important threat factors. But then adding complexity to the threats is the is the is the is the pandemic that has disrupted the entire tourism economies. So right from job losses and business shutdown to uh, some of the royalties, which I'm giving examples. So there is a link to it, which you can look uh, uh, later when this is being circulated. But based on the the, the whole uh, uh, disruptions, as well as the shutdown of the international tourism uh, travel, uh, the UNDW has already uh, predicted that you know there is going to be a loss of almost like $4 trillion uh, to the global GDP in the coming year, especially 20 and 21. So um, with these issues, now how can we ensure that sustainable mountain tourism uh, futures in the HKH? And so this really helps us to really remind that, you know, our effort to really addressing both climate and pandemic needs to really um, comply or, you know, has to be really brought from the look from the perspective of making this industry, our businesses green, inclusive and resilient uh, with the purpose of building back better, because this is the opportunities that we are given to really, really look at, you know, um, how can we make uh, our, our, our businesses more resi uh, resilient and more green and more inclusive. So I'm, I'm now presenting uh, three uh, pilot cases uh, in relation to how are we really taking these issues and converting into an opportunities and primarily the opportunities which we are tapping into is that the, the whole aspects of or the agenda of entrepreneurship and in investment is becoming quite a prominent discourse now, primarily in the areas of, you know, greening the tourism businesses, services, as well as green investments. Uh, um, so uh, the first pilot is from uh, our one of our pilot sites in Hanlong village in China, in Yunnan province. The Hanlong village uh, is uh, one of the most impoverished 
parts of China. Um, obviously, Yunnan is one of the 14 poverty stricken areas uh, declared by China. Uh, but the beauty of this village is that it lies on the periphery of uh, Gaoliung Chang National Nature Reserve, uh, which is very well known for its biodiversity, especially for the AB fauna or bird uh, biodiversities. Um, so these, uh, the communities of this uh, Hanlong village primarily were villager uh, farmers, but because of the changes in climate, uh, you know, there were really uh, their livelihoods, the traditional livelihoods were impacted. So um, back in 2000, <clears throat> Nine, um, the um, uh, the local government, uh, in partnership with the communities, uh, in collaboration with EC Mode, we established or form uh, a pilot work, uh, trying to really innovate. How can we ensure the bird uh, diversity by conserving the species, but at the same time bring income to the communities? And that's how the birth of the community-based uh, bird photography tourism um, uh, came into existence. Um, and this is uh, quite an important um, uh, thing for us to understand is until 2009, um, the Hanlong was already a, a, you know, a site for bird watcher communities, but there were primarily few international tourists. But since 2009, the whole market, uh, you know, became quite a, uh, you know, uh, there was a shift in the market, especially the rise of the domestic tourists. And also not only the domestic tourists, but these tourists also was, you know, part of a very special market segment, especially the rich and highly educated um, um, uh, tourists were very much attracted to in this kind of an activities. And this has really led to, uh, you know, uh, gave us a sort of energy to the communities to really engage in this uh, bird photography tourism uh, promotions um, in order to ensure, because this is quite a special market in a sense that it is a high end tourist to really, um, um, you know, um, uh, have them or um, provide a high quality visitor experiences and enhance the sense of awareness. Um, um, so there were a lot of, uh, you know, um, efforts were being made in relation to providing you know, establishing world-class uh, infrastructure, services, as well as facilities, right from in, uh, information centers, the board pond area, signages, uh, heights. So this is really, uh, you know, helping them to really enhance the experiences and also giving them a maximum chances of understanding the value of birds and the sighting that they have and also guaranteeing that there is a proper um, you know um, 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 incidences of where they could take a lot of photos uh, it's not So um, talking about the photos, uh, you know, if you walk uh, in the in the village of Hanlong, you could see during the high peak season, every nooks and corner and forest areas are flooded by, you know, very enthusiastic bird watcher communities and photographers taking pictures of thousands of um, 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 uh, birds that they can see. Um, so much so that, uh, you know, they are um, the, the, photo, the wildlife uh, um, watchers, especially bird uh, watching communities really consider Hanlong as a paradise for bird watching tourism. Um, so this is um, what they call it. Uh, the Hanlong is a five-star bird watching tourist destination in China where, you know, um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of tourists uh, just in a span of three months uh, throng in the area primarily just to observe, take photos and, and just, you know, uh, spend their time. Um, so uh, what this has taught to the community is that because there is so much of income uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, generated from these businesses, communities are now realizing that the, you know, the, the value of to, uh, the birds, but in addition to the income, uh, you know, it also provides benefit to different uh, communities along the value chain, be it homestay operators, transport operators, uh, nature guides, bird watcher, you know, um, um, a, a, a community providing the catering services. Now, if you, uh, this is another interesting sighting. If you walk along the village of Hanong, every nooks and corner, you know, are very decorated with the murals and signages to do with the birds. So this really has, uh, you know, taught them that, you know, a bird comes first if they want to sustain their business. So this is really is a kind of a very win-win situation for the host communities as well as the guests. 
And one of the um, 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 by the you know, personal communi communications, uh, you know, the, the 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 idea of whether bird tourism is driving or bringing prosperity. Um, so, um, so this this very an, an excerpt from the interview would suggest that you know 20 years ago this community was very much there was nothing but the you know mud house stones, but now you have a you know because of the booming bird tourism, the big fancy buildings and all. So you know this is really a kind of an indicator as how that the communities are very much benefiting from it. Another example which I would like to also bring uh, to our, our attention here is that, uh, you know, the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh. Normally, when we think of Bangladesh, we get an image of a coastal areas, you know, fishing, fishermen communities. But, but, but uh, um, you know, you might be surprised, you know, Bangladesh also has uh, some of the hilly area and most beautiful sites that is becoming quite a popular amongst the adventure uh, you know tourist uh, communities or outdoor recreationists so we have also um, 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 uh, with the with the government of the ministry of chitigong hill track affairs and bandaban hill district council and private sector we piloted a community tourism in Moonlai village which is uh, which lies in the uh, bandaban hill districts of the chitigong hill tract the hill track has three districts and Bandarban is one of them. Um, so the Mullai village is, uh, is Bangladesh's first community tourism model. Um, the reason I'm saying is first community tourism model is that um, before this pilot started, the Mullai village was again one of the idyllic uh, mountain communities where uh, farming was a uh, zoom agriculture practice was the predominant. Besides that, uh, either the government service was the only way for the youth to be engaged. Otherwise, there was no so uh, um, alternative options for youth uh, to uh, be engaged in any other sorts of livelihood but uh, this this was one of the most beautiful village in the Chiriwang hill tracks having the cultural and natural um, you know riches as well as uh, you know very near to uh, Chittagong, almost uh, six and a half uh, hours of drive so we have uh, felt that you know this village needs to be very much uh, developed into a community-based tourism uh, so uh, the process of really starting the community-based tourism, um, like in any uh, you know uh, um, tourism development process, uh, started with the consultation and understanding the context, uh, issues and uh, challenges, opportunities, identifying the resources, who the stakeholders are, and how we can convert it into a kind of a development you know um, um, that brings benefit to the communities. Uh, this community is actually um, has. Um, you know, a, a typical uh, ethnic group called BOM, which are predominantly Christian communities, having around 54 households. So this whole idea of community, Mulai community, revolved around leaving no one behind in the sense, when we were designing this project, uh, we make sure that every member from the, or at least one member from the every household engaged or, you know, um, is benefited from this project. So for that purpose, we did uh, try to assess the livelihood opportunities and how they could be in integrated in income generations activities, followed by the business plan development, management committee, formation, marketing, and communications. Like, because again, this is one of the pristine and virgin areas, so everything had to be scratched. You know, the development had to st uh, start it from the scratch. But the goodness of this is because we are so much focusing on very much ecocentric and community focus. So all of the interventions that we had uh, um, um, promoted here was very much pro in a sense, outdoor nature centric activities. And one of the major highlight of this is that this Monlai village has the longest zip line of Bangladesh, which was you know established through this project. Um, in addition to a lot of trails, uh, you know, for the tourists to be engaged. Another important, which is a critical aspect of value chain, uh, you know, actors are the the women communities who, by traditionally, very much engaged in weaving, which is their very much uh, uh, traditional lifestyle as well as source of uh, income. So all the is, um, um, you know, the existing skills, the potential of the communities being engaged in income generation were very much explored. And um, 
uh, promoted and, and, and brought them into this whole development process. Now, uh, you know, so there is uh, this uh, website called Moonlight Mysteries of the Mountains that really uh, is the, the marketing front of this, uh, the pilots. Um, so we, I would encourage you to visit it and should you decide to go to visit Bangladesh, don't forget to visit Chittagong and particularly Moonlight. My last, uh, but not the least, the, the pilot is on this whole idea of, you know, how do we now address uh, primarily because of the COVID pandemic that uh, majority of the businesses are now really affected by it. So how can we ensure that these business can be brought back on track, but with a responsible business approaches. And so the, the, the tourivision, uh, tourivision hub is, is a kind of a hub where we are promoting innovation in tourism enterprises, uh, primarily with the focus of promoting or fostering the climate actions for green recovery. So this whole idea is that we have uh, made a call for applications um, for interested enterprises, uh, which are uh, providing mountain tourism services or businesses and we have engaged them in a sustainable business incubation program during which these um, entrepreneurs are trained to come up with a bankable business uh, plan, a business plan that really believes in the value of sustainability, providing, uh, you know, um, not only looking at the economic return, but also providing uh, values or services from the environmental and, and um, uh, social aspects as well. Uh, this is just an example of one of the enterprise, uh, which is uh, which has a very mixed or hybrid kind of an enterprise. Uh, for he 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 operates farm, a research center as well as homestays, and so he really wanted to utilize this you know COVID period where there was no business into something uh, creatively and something productive. So he was one of the selected entrepreneurs. Now he developed a business plan, uh, you know, with the purpose of really converting his homestay as a RE renewable energy demonstration park for recreation research and training and so for the plan was very much divided into the short term as well as the long term so you know how the renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions can bring those benefits so in short term we have really supported uh, the entrepreneurs to install the solar um, uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, for lighting of the homestays and all but in the long term uh, you know he wants to really promote a different sort of a clean energy solution right from high-tech greenhouses, solar dryers for nursery, food processing and preservations. But what this is ultimately contributing is that by being able to do that, he's able to, or planning to create more green jobs, provide training and, and technological disseminations, and also supporting local economic growth. That is the social value. And in the environmental... Okay, Arno, um, you have two yes. minutes. Thank you. Yeah, this is my last slide. So in the environmental um, um, value context, so, you know, trying to really establish the baseline emission of his businesses and uh, waste management and also sustaining the agroecology system because he really has that uh, organic farm centers also where he is really promoting organic uh, agriculture and horticultural practices. And based on that, you know, so he's also trying to really come up with the, uh, alluring the business for investment. So, uh, coming up with the return and the investment planning okay. so now um, um this brings back now let me uh, just you know while uh, concluding i would really want us to again um you know revisit uh, why and how the sustainable idea of sustainable mountain tourism has evolved or changed in our region and in that i would really want us to understand that you know the idea of the sustainable mountain tourism is not only related to what it means at the MSMEs or, or or community level, but what are the macro narrative that is also influencing, right? Because the basis are the resources, these assets that needs to be promoted. So the sustainability of mountain, definitely mountain tourism needs to look from the well-being and prosperity narrative so that this whole assets could be preserved. And if it is so, then we, the whole business as usual is not sufficient. So we need to think along the line of how we can make our tourism more green, inclusive and resilient. And at the program level, this definitely calls for really looking at, uh, you know, not only from the sectoral point of view, but really looking at from a more dynamic because there is an interdependence uh, of tourism with other sectors and other aspects. So in order to address these complex issues and harness the opportunity, it has to be looked from a nexus perspective. And one way to providing this opportunity is definitely by fostering the entrepreneurship, innovation and investment 
that is going to really key to build back better mountain tourism in the years to come. Thank you. Having said that, I would really like uh, to thank once again, uh, Dr. Lee, as well as the Professor Jaffrey and other organizing committee for giving me these opportunities. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alulama. Uh, thank you. Give our uh, viewer informative and uh, short uh, provoking uh, presentation uh, from Nepal. Uh, and so we also give our uh, uh, some some uh, 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 samples from uh, Nepal, from Bangladesh, from China. Um, okay, I will say uh, hello again to our uh, audience now. I see uh, we have roughly uh, 200 participants now. So to stay with us, uh, we, uh, we have more interesting presentation uh, and uh, inter interviews and uh, debates that they are coming up. Uh, from uh, Dr. Alulama presentation, and uh, I think that um, uh, as, as uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, about uh, 160 million tourists move across region borders to uh, uh, cruising uh, Himalayas in uh, 2019 uh, before the COVID-19. Uh, the uh, mountain tourism is a, a major uh, contributor uh, to local job, uh, employment and the entrepreneurs. But uh, uh, we're still facing, of course, the, the challenging, the, the climate change and uh, leads to the loss of the uh, glancers, uh, uh, glancers, uh, uh, all of them, and so uh, also uh, increasing the uh, occurrence of uh, extreme events. The, the pandemic, uh, of course, uh, dis uh, dis uh, disrupt uh, eruption uh, to tourism drive economics, especially in this uh, intercruising uh, Himalayas, job loss and the business shut down and uh, collapse and uh, opportunity. Oh, the towards uh, green, uh, inclusive, and uh, resilience, and uh, uh, community-based tourism can uh, can uh, restore. And uh, so, especially you mentioned the uh, your, your tour uh, tour vision uh, help is a very interesting tour. As uh, expected, uh, and I think that the the, the business uh, uh, um, vision program could involve the local community in it. So thank you, uh, thank you uh, once again, uh, uh, Dr. Alulama. So let me uh, let us move on to the second uh, latter speaker, uh, Dr. Liu Yong. Uh, Dr. Liu, uh, the floor is. I, I will briefly introduce yourself. Uh, the first uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Liu. Uh, Dr. Liu Yong uh, is a professor of uh, Institute of uh, uh, Sports at the Leisure. Uh, Sichuan Tourism University. Uh, Dr. Liu received two bachelor degrees from uh, of management and of finance, one from University of South California of uh, the United States in 1996, and the other a bachelor from Chengdu University of Information Technology in 1999. And uh, he also received the master degree in sport from uh, Sichuan University in uh, 2009 and uh, go, get, got the PhD in history from Sichuan University in 2017. Dr. Liu is currently the director of the research center of uh, mountain tourism and the layer sport development of Sichuan Tourism University. And uh, he has been engaged in mountain adventure and uh, mountain tourism research in Tibetan mountain region over uh, 30 years. And uh, Dr. Liu is also the only Chinese judge of the world highest mountaineering award, Golden Axe Award from uh, France. Uh, uh, he was uh, invited as the adventure <coughs> host of National Geography Channel in 2090 as well. Professor Liu helped the Sigulian uh, uh, Park, uh, just uh, the the, the, the going uh, uh, presentation and, uh, about the Sigulian Park of the Tibetan area to establish uh, China's first mountain tourism service and the management standard based on community participation. So his uh, research interesting include 
cultural heritage management, development, mountain tourism, and the impact Himalaya adventure, high attitude uh, uh, nutrition science. So the floor is yours, Dr. Liu Yong. Uh, okay. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Chen Li. Uh, can you see the uh, PowerPoint? Okay, very good. Cool. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Jaffrey, Professor Chen Li, uh, Professor Kazam, all the speakers and uh, dear audience. Uh, as Dr. Chen Li said, my name is Liu Yong. I'm from the Sichuan Tourism University of China. My school is based on the southwest uh, in China, which is very, very close to the Himalaya Tibetan mountain ridge. It's just a few hours driving to there. That's my background, uh, my backyard. Uh, it's a great pleasure to share some of the experience uh, with you of the Chinese uh, mountain tourism here. So my speech today is, uh, is uh, the involvement of the Tibetan community in mountain tourism. This is the case from the mountain Sigunyang uh, in China. So I have a, uh, a divide into four parts, but I make it short, shorter. First of all, I would like to give you a short uh, idea about where is the uh, Hendan Mountain. Uh, if you see uh, on this picture on the left side, there's a red point there. Uh, you can see the range from north to south. This is uh, what we call the Hendersha Mountain, which is the junction uh, of the first and second step of the Himalaya East. Uh, normally we call it the uh, second step of the Himalaya East. Uh, it makes the longest, uh, widest, and most uh, typical north-south mountain system and water system in China. So it's very unique. It has a, a very, very long and uh, steep uh, valley. Uh, most of the elevation here is between 4,000 to 6,000 meters. And uh, from the mountain to the valley, normally it has a 2,000 meters uh, difference. Uh, due to the uh, unique uh, geographic location of the Honda Mountain, uh, we formed it as a Hindu mountain culture, tourism, economic uh, circle in back to 1990s. In 1980, there was a famous uh, Chinese sociologist called uh, Fei Xiaotong. He gave the name uh, of this area called the Tibetan E Minority Corridor in this uh, uh, Hindu and Himalaya area. If you see the pictures, you can see the river. It comes from the East uh, Himalaya. Uh, to Sigunya area uh, and uh, uh, then go to the oldest uh, water irrigation system, Dujiang Yan. Uh, it uh, irrigates about uh, 18 million square kilometers of the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 180,000 uh, square kilometers of the Chengdu plan, uh, raise more, more than three, uh, I'm sorry, 30 million people in these areas. And uh, this is uh, this place is called the uh, Sigunyang, uh, which is uh, uh, the place where really focus on our study for over thirty years. Uh, so uh, Sigunyang is the um, is located on the very uh, east of Hendan Mountain, and uh, it has a five hundred seventy square kilometers. Uh, there are like a two, over two hundred fifty three uh, snow peaks. Uh, which is over 4,000 meters. The highest uh, you can see from the picture on the left side is uh, the main peak. It's called the Sikola Peak, which is uh, uh, 6,250 meters high. Uh, there are like uh, 53 of the mountains here are over 5,000 meters. So this is a typical uh, mountain tourism uh, resources here. And this is also the uh, most famous uh, alpine climbing area in China. And uh, it has a world-class mountain resources here. So it's attract a lot of uh, mountain uh, tourists and uh, climbers here. In this area, there are 
there are like five Tibetan villages under these uh, places. Uh, from the picture, you see this beautiful uh, uh, mountain village is called the Changpin village, which is located on the altitude of uh, 3,600 meters. Uh, the majority in this area uh, are Tibetans, are local Tibetans, and the rest of them are Han Chinese, uh, Hui and Qing, uh, Chan and some others. Uh, by uh, 2019, the population in this area is uh, 3,300, uh, the locals, but of course now they have a lot of uh, people move here from outside to running their business here. So uh, roughly it will be uh, like 8,000 people uh, living here right now. Uh, this is the local people. We call them Jalung Tibetan people. This is the oldest triple of the Tibetan in here. Uh, they have a long uh, histories and uh, religions here, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, today here because uh, the uh, time limit. Uh, so in 1920s, uh, 1924, the very old uh, time, the American adventurer Joseph Rock uh, started his expedition to China and he started from the uh, Lijiang in Yunnan province uh, to Daochen, uh, finished in uh, Sichuan. Uh, this is what people call the Shangri-La area. Uh, Sigunya is one of the most important parts of his uh, expedition and uh, now there, this is a very famous uh, trekking and hiking route. It's called the uh, Joseph Rock's uh, Road. Uh, back, it, uh, back to 1970s and 1980s, uh, there comes uh, is Koreans, Americans, and Japanese uh, start to come to these places. And they start doing uh, wildlife uh, photography, uh, climbing, alpine climbing, uh, mountain hiking, camping, and those uh, outdoor uh, activities. And then they start to hire some locals uh, to uh, as a porter uh, and guide for them. So the local uh, villagers start to get some uh, benefits, uh, some income from uh, mountain tourism. That, that was the earliest uh, tourism uh, in this area. I start my expedition, my uh, adventure uh, life uh, back to 19, early 1990s. Uh, my friends and I, we went to that place. We, we, we did a lot of crazy, uh, you know, people, uh, crazy things like uh, what the young people, young climber uh, normally did this area. But at the same time, I found that there are very, very few uh, locals involved in the mountain tourism. And uh, uh, so we, we decided to help them to, to, to get involved in this uh, industry. And my friends and I, we make the team there. We start to uh, get to, into the two villages there, which is very close to the mountain. And we teach them how to climb and how to guide people and how to service uh, for the uh, outdoor peoples. Um, but uh, shortly, uh, we found it's not uh, very, the effect is not so good uh, because the location is quite different from this area. Some villages uh, were on a very high altitude uh, in the mountain and some villages uh, located in the, in the uh, place which very close to the road. So uh, people who live in the lower part they start to involve the, uh, this uh, tourism and they, they start to make money at first and they get rich and they, they bought the new house, they, they built the new house, they bought cars and uh, the gap between poor and rich uh, become uh, widely. And uh, then the people from higher uh, land, they came down to these places uh, and they, they start to com uh, compete with the uh, other villages. So they, they lowered down the prices. And sometimes I, I saw the fight uh, among these uh, villagers, I realized uh, we should find another way to do it. And uh, sometimes they even fight with a, a, a tourist. Uh, I realized uh, maybe it's because they don't have this uh, unified organization or management. There's no standard of the uh, outdoor uh, activities. 
So then uh, we went to the local government. We talked with them, and uh, we we tried to uh, we tried to help with them. Uh, in that time, back to the 1990s, there was no professional uh, mountain tourism guys in uh, local government. Because this is in the uh, West China, uh, the government uh, managed most of the uh, sales in, uh, for the community. So uh, what we did is uh, we start to, we, first of all, we start to make a plan for the outdoor activities and mountain tourism plan for, for the government. And uh, we uh, also uh, uh, start to develop in some uh, hiking trails uh, first for, the, for them. And then we introduce some uh, outdoor events and uh, outdoor uh, business company here. Uh, and also we spent uh, two, two and a half years to establish the first standard outdoor management system. This is the first one in China actually. Uh, then we start to educate people uh, how to work in the uh, hotel industry and we're training them uh, to be a mountain guide. Uh, uh, we're training them some uh, outdoor skill. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's really helped. And then we, this is what we did at first. We, we did this uh, uh, outdoor uh, activities plan for this whole area. Uh, of course, we work with the government and the communities together. Uh, we, we have a specific uh, spot for what kind of uh, mountain tourism uh, project they should put in this area. Uh, and, sorry. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you see this, uh, you look at this picture, but I'm, I'm sorry, this is Chinese here. I, I didn't have time to translate yesterday. But uh, if you see the left side, uh, we even try to give the label of the uh, different uh, outdoor uh, activities. This is a hiking level. So we divide it into in, uh, three levels. Uh, from level one, you can see, uh, normally it's not, uh, you don't need to camp. You, ha you can only have a day pack and uh, easy uh, hiking. You don't need to hire a guide. But if it goes to uh, level three, uh, it means you have to hike um, over 20 kilometers a day. You have to uh, camp at least two nights. And uh, the road is uh, quite dangerous and hard, and uh, you need to hire a guide. Uh, so we, we try to uh, we try to give the label for different uh, activities. Then the tourists can come here; they can pick up the uh, the routes or the uh, activities uh, by their body position or uh, the situation. Uh, at the same time, we organize a different uh, team, a different uh, uh, people, organization uh, to there to give them education, uh, to train them. So the, um, in the past 20 years, I think we organized over 50 uh, times different training there. We trained over 1,200 uh, locals. Uh, but our, our training is not only outdoor training. We have uh, we have training of the, the outdoor skills. We have training even uh, some basic uh, photography skills. Uh, uh, even sometimes we, we, we teach them uh, English, a uh, basic English, because there are a lot of uh, uh, foreign uh, tourists to there. All these pictures uh, are shown uh, our training there. Uh, we're still doing this uh, right now, actually. Uh, as you know, uh, outdoor activities uh, at Mountain Trim uh, has uh, some risk. So uh, without any uh, rescue system or very good uh, management, uh, the accident happens, always happens, uh, especially uh, 15 years ago. Uh, every time when it happens, uh, they, they send people to there to research. Uh, to search and uh, do a uh, rescue, but uh, nobody knows the technique. So it's caused the second uh, accident. So uh, then we start to help them to, um, to set up the first uh, uh, high altitude uh, mountain rescue team. This is the first Chinese uh, mountain rescue team. And now uh, it has uh, about 18 full-time uh, members and uh, 60 uh, part-time uh, members right now. If you see these uh, uh, pictures, you can see five of them, these people, uh, they're from the same family actually. And they're running their own uh, mountain tourism business. 
and you can see they're they're well e equipped because we we try to we helped them to fund the sponsorship from some big uh, uh, outdoor company. Actually, uh, they they took a lot of uh, rescue team. Uh, it turns to this page. Uh, you can see this is the training area. We, we brought these people to the uh, mountains. Uh, we trained them how to climb the mountains, do alpine climbing, how to use the rope, and we trained them the rescue uh, skill. And the, most of the members are mountain guides, and uh, you know they're involved in the mountain tourism, so they are very skillful. And uh, uh, before they may they may be the the nomads or hunters, so. They know pretty well uh, uh, this area terrain, so it's very good for them to uh, to 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 involve this uh, team. And as we set up this uh, rescue team, that the rescue um, system, now the accident uh, numbers reduce very fast. Last year, there's only one uh, accident; uh, one guy died from uh, climbing, but it's uh, the rest of the. Uh, uh, activities are, are pretty safe. Uh, so by over 15 years uh, mountain tourism development, it's really impacted the community. Uh, the sense really changed here. Uh, of course, uh, first the, the poverty reduced uh, from the village a few years ago. Also the, uh, the industrial structure really changed. People, uh, most of people start to work for uh, tourism instead uh, of uh, farming. Uh, and uh, education uh, changed as well. Uh, from the guest host the interaction, they know they knows a lot from outside. And uh, if you go to this village, you gotta say uh, most of the young kids, they uh, are starting outside in the big city, the good school. And uh, some of them already graduated from the high school. They, then they came back to the, uh, their home to run in their own family business. Uh, of course, uh, also promoting ecotourism, the, what we call civilization uh, changed, but I'll talk it later. Uh, the income of this uh, area really increased uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, you can see it, uh, 2015 was uh, about $2 million. And uh, 2019, before the pandemic, uh, the grass uh, products here was uh, almost like a three thousand uh, three million dollar. Oh, sorry, I have to. And the industry really changed. Uh, they uh, they moving from a semi uh, pastoral and the semi uh, agricultural economy uh, to this uh, new type of the professional. Uh, farming, what we call the new professional farmers. Uh, if you see the data, you can see um, there are about uh, more than 2,100 locals. Uh, they're directly engaged in mountain tourism right now. Uh, the data uh, from uh, 2017 uh, we found there like uh, more than 75 families has uh, an income of uh, $6,000 to $10,000 a year, but now it's getting much more. Uh, of course, uh, the mountain tourism development caused the inf uh, infrastructure uh, improved. Uh, the government uh, spent a lot of money. They built this uh, uh, highway from the uh, one of the biggest city in the southwest of China. Uh, Chengdu to Sigunyang. This is a 250 kilometers mountain with a lot of uh, channels and bridges, and it brings a lot of tourists to, to here. Now, if you start uh, from this uh, 20 million people's city to mountain Sigunyang, it only takes about three and a half hour. Before, about 20 years ago, it could be 10 hour, uh, 15 hour, uh, 18 hour depends on the uh, road condition. But now it's very, it's very, very, very easy. Uh, unlike the normal tourist, the outdoor tourist, uh, they spent uh, roughly, uh, I think, uh, um, more than hundred dollar per day in Mountain Sigunyang uh, area 
and more than half of the $100 uh, uh, goes into this uh, local's pocket. Oh, also, the month- Five minutes, uh, Dr. Liu. Okay, okay. Okay, I'll make it quick. Uh, also, the, the uh, environment uh, changed very much, uh, very quick. Uh, you can see the uh, download, uh, downside on the left side, you can see there was a picture from uh, of the snow leopard was taken by a very wild, a very famous wildlife uh, photographer in 2017, I'm sorry. Uh, this uh, snow leopard uh, disappeared in this year for, for a long time. Uh, we have a station there. So we sent uh, professors, teachers, and students there uh, all the time. We investigate this area for over uh, 15 years. So there are a lot of uh, culture change. Uh, th this, this guy, is, his name is Tashi. He's, uh, he's a mountain guide now, but he was a former hunter. He, uh, when we interviewed him, he, this is what he said. He said, we never smoke or drink in the course of uh, our work. We argue our guests to sort their rubbish. There used to be a lot of drinking and fighting in the town, but now public security is good. We have built uh, fixed rubbish uh, spots in Dafeng, this is mountain, and pick up any rubbish uh, we see on the road. We have uh, controlled numbers of horses and reduce the uh, damage of environment, mental vegetation. And there used to be a dry toilet. Unless there were rain shower, we could not brush our tooth uh, back to 20 years ago. The water and uh, electricity supplies are now perfect. So we can change some of the bad habits. Uh, uh, from uh, two years ago, the uh, disposable income of the person here was uh, uh, $2,400 a year. And now the government also have another big uh, project. They start to build a mountain uh, train uh, line from the city, uh, big city to uh, uh, Sigunyang. It's uh, 150 kilometers and uh, the speed were uh, raised to a maximum to 120 uh, kilometers uh, per hour. After five years, uh, people, uh, tourists can go to uh, Sigunyang within about one and a half hour, and uh, it will bring uh, more than two million tourists to, to this area. Uh, if, you can, uh, if you go to this area, you can see there are a lot of uh, uh, hostels, homestay hotels, and uh, uh, almost the whole uh, community are involved in uh, tourism. Uh, there are about 800 uh, homestay hotels there with more than 13,000 beds. And uh, uh, even last year, uh, after the COVID-19, they still have a lot of uh, tourists there. Uh, it's like uh, 600,000 uh, tourists visit uh, these places. And uh, the total uh, tourism income was 46 million US dollars. Uh, it has a 27% uh, uh, year increased. Uh, what we're, this is what we're doing right now. We, we try to develop in a new area and new routes. Uh, last year, we organized a team with uh, locals and uh, 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 some other uh, sports uh, guy. We, we explored the uh, circle uh, hiking routes around this Honey Mountain, which is 108 kilometers long. And uh, it was the uh, first time people explore it. And then we wrote the reports, we gave it to the community and the uh, government. They're going to open it for to a tourist uh, next year. Uh, you can see there's a lot of uh, beautiful uh, views here, uh, a high um, altitude lake, some wetland, uh, a lot of snow uh, peaks uh, there. Uh, shortly uh, from the work, what we did, uh, uh, we, we, what we done, we have done in Mountain Sigunyan last uh, 15 years, we achieved a very good result. Uh, the model we summarized uh, is joint uh, participation of organization, uh, government, community, and villagers together. Uh, this model uh, also helps uh, the community of tourism develop in, in other uh, mountain ranges uh, close here. But what we do now is we want to promote this model in some uh, little far uh, mountain area in Sichuan province because Sichuan is the uh, biggest mountain uh, province in China. Uh, for example, we now we have a contact with uh, another area. It's called uh, Heizhou in uh, uh, 
a little, little bit north in Daliang San mountain ridge. There live the uh, minorities called the uh, E minorities. We we're, we're prepared to do the same work there. So uh, hopefully uh, after a few years, we, we have another uh, experience to share with uh, uh, all of you. Uh, okay, I think my time is, uh, my time is, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, uh, once again. Thanks, um, uh, Professor Tsunni, Professor Jeffrey, uh, Professor Kazam, and uh, hope uh, uh, all of you have a chance to come to Sigunyang to visit uh, this uh, beautiful mountain area. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Liu Yong. Uh, we were wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you, great uh, deal of work uh, for the local people. That uh, it's it's a very uh, successful example that um, could uh, uh, mix mix the local local people, local uh, uh, local community involved, and uh, we also can benefit from the mountain tourism. Uh, as Doctor Liu uh, mentioned, that uh, uh, the uh, a regulatory organization that uh, Dr. Liu uh, organized this and uh, take part in this for the training and uh, mounting guide. And uh, was, it was start, uh, start uh, in the uh, 1990s, but it was not success and, and for, uh, successful uh, at the first. It had a uh, low unify, unified organization and the management and the result of confusing about the price and the services uh, that is ordered competition. So based, uh, based on your promotion, I think that um, uh, is very effective that uh, help the government to generate uh, or also finish the master uh, plan for the uh, mountaineering uh, uh, development, setting up the first uh, mountain rescue team uh, in China. So develop uh, Lincoln Trail, establishing the first standard outdoor management system. It's wonderful. And, uh, so uh, really, real uh, benefit uh, the, the, the local people. Out of nine, uh, outdoor standard for mountain schooling and uh, the, uh, also the educating the people to work in the, the, the uh, uh, hotel industry and the training mountain guide in outdoor uh, scale and um, uh, mountain uh, risk of team scale. So you did not have a uh, Sikunyang mountain tourism. Mountain tourism development, uh, development in Sikunyang uh, uh, eradicating uh, poverty uh, in all villages, the five villages you mentioned, uh, upgrading the industry structure, making education, uh, education change, improves, uh, but of course also making uh, another uh, uh, cultural impact. Uh, I think that we still have a lot of time to talk uh, in the future. Okay, uh, let's move on uh, to the third speaker, uh, Lima, uh, Dr. Lima Lama. So I also uh, brief introduce uh, Dr. Nima uh, 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 Dima Sherba. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Nima is a uh, local people, and uh, uh, also uh, he uh, is an uh, expedition doctor and operator, as also a session at adventure. So I think that. Uh, 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 Dr. Nima will provide our very special uh, perspective how to look at the uh, mountain tourism uh, in his uh, hometown. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nima got uh, his Bachelor of Medicine and the Surgeon from Tianjin Medical University in in uh, 2009 and got an international diploma of Mountain Emergency Medicine from. Institute of Mountain Medicine, uh, Italy, in 2014. Dr. Lima, uh, born and uh, raised in Mountain Everest region, he is currently involved in the adventure tourism industry by combining his compassion and the prof profession. Dr. Uh, Lima uh, Sherba specializes uh, in high attitude medicine, uh, mountain emergency medicine rescue and uh, mountaineering. It has a summit include uh, mountain uh, Everest, mountain Malas Malasu, and the mountain uh, Atapalam, and the mountain uh, Delali, and so many uh, very high, very famous uh, mountain peak. 
So to learn a film, okay, right? Uh, he has uh, participated in more than a dozen uh, 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 expedition and uh, mountain rescue uh, mission. And uh, uh, Dr. Sherba uh, have uh, uh, Nima Sherba has received uh, numerous uh, uh, notes uh, for his contribute in the development of mountaineering at the tourism industry from Lipo. Lipo government, uh, besides being uh, featured in many uh, uh, documentary and articles by local international media. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Nima, really? Nima Shirban. Can I share your screen? Dr. Nima? No, can you see? Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, okay, fine. We are good. Thank you, Dr. Lee, uh, for the introduction. And thank you, Professor Kazan, Jafar, and everyone of the Scott Webinar Organizing Committee. It's very humble and honored to be part of the webinar here. And so today, I'll be talking about the mountain tourism and the Shepherds of Everest. <laughs> So let me just introduce myself briefly as well. So my name is Nimanam Sherpa. By profession, I was a medical doctor, but now I'm into adventure tourism business. So I especially focus on expedition operation in, uh, on big mountains. Besides being an outdoor educator and also um, a wilderness first aid trainer and educator in Nepal, so I've been training many trekking guides and mountain guides over the last couple of years to ensure safety on the mountain. So the reason I got into this, into the mountain was um, my passion. And now I've kind of like combined into my profession. So it's really great. And today I'll be focusing especially on the Kumbu region and Mount Everest. And uh, as you can see on the picture here, you can see climbers going up the ladders and the famous Kumbu Icefall, this is between base camp and camp one, when people have to go, you know, um, across the Kumbu Icefall to climb Everest. So the impact of mountain tourism in the Kumbu area has been something like this, you know, the Sherpa community and the people living there, you know, they've been climbing over the last few decades um, because of, uh, in terms of um, the social economic changes and cultural and social changes and also the environmental impact, etc. So today I'll be talking mostly about the impact on the Kumbu region. So first of all, I would like to introduce about the Sherpa people, you know, Sherpas of Kumbu. So who are the Sherpa people? There's a lot of confusion right now at oftentimes because um, the Sherpa has also has a job title so anybody who was guiding or working on the mountain is called a Sherpa. But in fact, so we are the people that live in the northeastern part of Nepal. So originally, they came from the eastern part of Tibet. So they migrated in, into Upper Kumbu and they settled up there. So Sherpa is on the people of the east. And from the Mount Everest region, so the people, the Sherpa people migrated to different parts of Nepal in search of work, in search of uh, better living conditions while, while some people decided to live up there. So we're an ethnic minority, minority group. So our origin is a Tibetan origin. Our language, we have a Sherpa language, which is very similar to Tibetan language. Many words are similar. We follow Tibetan Buddhism. And culture and tradition, well, it's pretty much um, similar to, to the Tibetans. And traditionally, you know, our ancestors, our grandfathers, they were um, yak farmers and traders, but trader in the sense between Kumbu and Tibet and also parts of the lower Solo Kumbu region. So they were trading on the more health, they had kind of like barter trade kind of thing. Um, so coming back to, well, the topic, you know, the Mount Everest. So one mountain that changed everything, not only the people living in the local community, but also the people that came to climb Mount Everest, you know, everybody had benefited in, in many ways. So definitely the local community in the 
region above Lukla have definitely benefited from Mount Everest a lot over the years. Uh, since the first expeditions came to Mount Everest, you know, the Western explorers, they came to climb Mount Everest. And back then it was more, so if you talk about the expedition, so things have changed as well, you know, the way expeditions were run. So in the early days, it was more like a national pride project. Run. And now it's more commercial expedition. So in the past, it used to be like, okay, the American expedition, the British expedition, Chinese expedition, the Swiss expedition, you know, they want to be the first to climb Mount Everest. So it was pretty much funded by the governments. And they would come, you know, they'd make a team and come to the uh, to climb Mount Everest. And but now it's very commercialized. So we don't have national pride expeditions anymore. It's pretty much run by people like myself and my, uh, different companies. So now it's like, um, well, now not really a lot of climbers. Now it's more like a mountain tourist. And so, so we provide logistic services to paying clients who, who have a dream and wish to stand on the top of the mountain. So, um, Everest definitely, it's always in the media all the time. And every season, at March, April, May, it's always on the news. Anything that happens on Everest, it's a big news. So, you know, like um, even in the region, so we can either take it as a blessing or a curse um, because it's there. So we cannot stop anything. You see, like um, if you just Google Sherpas, Mount Everest, uh, it's endless. There's so many things that comes up immediately. Uh, everyone has an interest in the Everest region and that is also one of the reasons why, you know, the Sherpa people of the Kumbu region have benefited a lot compared to Sherpas living from the other region. Um, because the tourists came in, everybody has interest there. So it's always in the media, it's always uh, everywhere. So I think it has both the pros and cons of being famous. So, if you talk about the impact and the changes, um, for me, because I've seen it myself, I was born and raised in Kumjin village, you know, so in the early 1980s, and I went to school there in the famous Kumjin school, which was built by Sir Edmund Hillary after he climbed Mount Everest in 1953. So when he asked the, his fellow Sherpas who helped him to climb the mountain, and he said, the, one of the Sherpas, he was very wise, I think, and he said, like, our children have eyes, but they're blind. We need education for our children. So that's when Sir Edmund Hillary started his philanthropic work in the Kumbu Valley. So he started building schools, he started building hospitals. And then things change a lot gradually. So having seen myself, so my parents, you know, they used to run a tea house in the village. My father was a trekking guy. And later on, I went to, I was sent to Kathmandu for higher education by my parents because of the school in Komjin wasn't really, well, it was good, but it was not really good. And then I moved on, you know, from Kathmandu to China, Europe, North America, everywhere and to become who I am today. So me, I'm also one of the direct benefic beneficiaries of Mount Everest, the legacy of Sir Edmund Hillary and the mountain tourism in the Kumbu region. Um, so the biggest changes that have happened in the Kumbu region in terms of like promoting mountain tourism, I think it was after Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing climbed, Tenzing Norga Sherpa climbed Mount Everest in 1953 and it's, you know, like overnight got very popular. Everybody wanted to see Mount Everest. Everybody wanted to come to Everest Base Camp. Those who wanted to, those who can climb when um, those who cannot or didn't really have the passion to climb higher up, they all at least came to ever see Everest you know, base camp. So the movement, you know, like of mountaineers and trekkers increased, which directly had an impact on the social economic status of the region, education and health improved because people like Sir Edmund Hillary started their philanthropic work and more and more donations came in. So a lot of schools were built, a lot of hospitals were built. So local people had the opportunity to, you know, go to school and so the culture and tradition also did have, you know, um, an impact of the 
Western influence and also the social economic status um, as it increased. And well, on the other hand, again, the environment also had its share of uh, impacts and everyone even today talks about the environment, uh, the rubbish on Everest and, or the rubbish on the mountains every, every year, every season. Um, so talking about the expedition and trekking business, so I'm, I'm a very young expedition business operator right now. You know, it's only been a couple of years. But if you look back, you know, so when the number of people started to, the number of people, you know, wanted to come to Everest or the Kumbu Valley increase or to climb Everest increase, the demand for logistic services, service provider increased, the demand for trekking guides and climbing sherpas increased, the demand for lodges and tea houses increased. So I want to highlight one thing here, you know, like my mother started a tea house back in the 1960s, I think, you know, and it, it, it was in a, a summer because um, they used to go up in the mountain, you know, to graze because my our grandfather, you know, they had a lot of yaks. So they, it was more like a summer shelter, a small hut. So tourists would, we used to come in, they had no place to stay. So they would just, you know, use uh, one of the smaller, share a space with the yak herders. And that's when people started to learn, you know, well, they can build tea houses, you know, like sell, um shelter food and then that's what my mom started you know they started from a very small place and then later on when she learned that well this can bring uh, money to the family so they my family started building them in bigger tea houses and now we have uh, a few tea houses also in the Kumbu valley and even for the local people you know the demand for potatoes so traditionally everyone was everyone were farmers even in Kum, right now in Kumbu, the only thing we can go grow is potatoes nothing else. So even potatoes, you know, like uh, right now, because of the increased consumption and demand, you know, even the four families, you know, they are able to sell and make some money out of that. So with change in demand and the supply chain, you know, it kind of like change and now uh, the local econ economy was growing stronger and everyone, well, everything changed. The spending capacity of the people in the Kumbu increase, you know, the lifestyle changes change, the social economic status of the people in the Kumbu changed so dramatically. I think if you look at the GDP of Nepal, I think Kumbu has the highest uh, the people in the Kumbu region or the business in the Kumbu region has, has the highest GDP. And also one of the most expensive places to live in Nepal, I think it's above Lukla. You can imagine, you know, everything costs almost twice the amount in Kathmandu, but still people are able, able to afford, which means like um, they have money to spend. They, they have, well, I mean, like I think they are earning good money up there. Uh, so getting back to expedition, because now I would like to talk more on the expedition part and uh, also the mountain tourism um, of the impact and stuff. So this is a base camp, a campsite in every on on Mount Everest, Everest Base Camp. So earlier, um, Dr. Anu did mention about, you know, about the $4 million revenue generated by the climbers coming to Mount Everest. So this is just one part of a huge base camp. So in the spring season, there are thousands of people in Everest Base Camp. It's more like a mini global village. People from different countries, you know, everyone is gathered there for, to achieve one goal, you know, to get to the top of the highest mountain. So right now what I do is I provide logistic services to people willing to, uh, wishing to climb in a safe and um, sec secure way, helping them achieve their dreams. So back in the days, um, like I told earlier, you know, Sherpas were traditionally just yak herders and farmers, but now I think the Sherpas of today are no more limited to just only climbing mountain, let alone yak herding. You know, things have changed. We have changed because of the exposure, exposure to the Western world and also the people that are coming to um, climb mountains, everything. Now we are like, you know, because of the 
improve, I think because of uh, the improvement in the social economic status, like, you know, now uh, the Sherpas are business owners, they are doctors, they are pilots, they are like engineers and uh, employees and, and they live all over the world, you know. Uh, you sure yeah, you have two minutes. yeah, and so, so the trekking and industry expedition, you know, like um, really created opportunities for the Sherpa people. They changed from nobody to somebody, and it created an education opportunity. And also, you know, like um, the people learn a lot from being from the people that come into the region, and over the years. The Sherpa people now, they're not just, um, you know, limited to climbing, but I think we have changed a lot uh, because of the, because of Mount Everest and that, and the, and the people that came to Mount Everest, you know, the mountain tourism opened many doors for us. And so from an ethnic minority community, from a very, you know, marginalized group in Nepal now, I think uh, it's one of the most uh, Sherpa community in the Kumbu Valley and elsewhere now, it's, um, one of the most highly respected, uh, I think, people of Nepal in terms of many things. So I believe um, the influence of the culture and tradition, you know, like uh, did also have an impact. So with change in time, the Sherpa people also did change. We have changed, you know, especially the younger generation. So there's a lot of concern as well right now, you know, losing our culture and tradition, such as language, you know, cultural practices, besides many other things. Because a lot of Sherpas started, you know, like moving from the village to the city and from city to abroad, you know, travel, uh, moving abroad. So I think that's a, a major concern that we see as well, you know. Um, so even for example, like myself, um, although I can speak my language because I was born and raised in the village, but the majority of Sherpa people living in Kathmandu, the younger generation of my age, even of my age, cannot speak the language. Yeah, forget about the upcoming younger generations, you know. And so this is, um, so to the left, it's my grandfather and grandmother back in the days, maybe in the, in the 60s, and this is myself. So the change is very apparent. And this is inevitable, you know, I don't, because we have to go, go with the time. So no matter how, how hard we try, because now, uh, because of the present uh, situation now, everybody wants a convenient lifestyle. Everybody wants more opportunities. Everybody wants better life. So the trend will continue to move from the village to the city and from city to other, other countries where there is more opportunity for people like myself. And although I'm still trying to you know, stay back in the country and try to do something here, but the majority of the sh our community people, you know, if they had a chance, they would just move. And um, it's an individual choice. And so it's really hard for uh, people and for the community to talk about, you know, the conservation and preservation of the culture right now. It's a big challenge. I think it all because of, you know, it opened the doors for us. Um, so Sherpas will keep changing, you know, and the, but Everest will always be there. So the Sherpa community, no matter what, will always be part of um, Mount Everest. It was, and it will always be part of our life. Altitude. And we are who we are today because of Mount Everest, and we are very grateful. And me, myself, you know, individually as a person, I will try my best, you know, to do whatever is um whatever the, we can do best on the mountain in terms of safety, security, you know, keeping the mountain clean, me as an expedition operator now, and uh, being a sensible, responsible operator, I want to lead by example, you know, show other people how we can make it better, you know, still being connected to Mount Everest to make a living out of that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, thank you, Dr. Nima. Thank you, great uh, presentation uh, the, from the local people of uh, Lipo. It's a very, very unique uh, perspective that to, uh, to, to, to look at the mountain tourism. Uh, so I, I think that you really are a handsome guy and um, I wish <laughs> you everything would be uh, uh, operate well and after the pandemic. Uh, um, so uh, with the uh, 
uh, as you mentioned, with the uh, increasing number of uh, foreign visitors, the uh, transformation was uh, inevitable. Uh, inevitable. That's the biggest challenge happened after the first summit, of course, the, the, the Mount Everest in 1953, uh, uh, you mentioned. The, the challenge including the social economic status, education, healthy, and cultural tradition, and the environmental lifestyle. You mentioned a lot of the things about this. And uh, of course, that's uh, something also, also can, uh, can change. That's the capability from the mountain tourism. Uh, 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 logistic service provide and uh, uh, tracking guide and the climb guide and uh, and uh, the uh, Sherpa people can uh, Sherpa can provide this service uh, local economic growth and um, uh, uh, also uh, so you find that uh, with the economic development uh, uh, exposure exposure to a uh, Western uh, uh, culture lifestyle has have changed uh, uh, relative compared to traditional ways of life, especially a young generation, uh, just from you, the perspective. So it's very uh, important the topic that uh, we, I think that we should discuss uh, this uh, in the future. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Nima. I wish you uh, everything goes well. And uh, we have to move to the last presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Rogers. So I will briefly introduce uh, uh, Paul, uh, Dr. Paul uh, Rogers. Um, uh, Dr. Paul Rogers is one of uh, Asia Pacific most uh, uh, experienced tourism for tourism uh, 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 practitioners. And he completed his uh, PhD uh, on uh, tourism development and change in, in, in uh, Sagamasa. Um, um, uh, Mountain areas to this area, uh, national park and its uh, environs uh, in, in 1997 from University of Wales in the United Kingdom. Kingdom. And uh, Dr. Rogers uh, is co founder co founder of Planet Happiness, a tourism and a big data project of the non profit and the happiness uh, airlines. And Paul has uh, 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 over 20 years experience uh, as a senior tourism advisor, uh, advisor to uh, national and local tourism organizations, including as part of consulate with the Uli Lishin, uh, WTO, uh, UNWTO, the, Black, uh, the World Bank, uh, Asian Development Bank, and uh, uh, numerous uh, other international organizations. He has worked extensively in Lipo, Bhutan, uh, Laos, and, uh, and the Great uh, Mekong region, and as well as uh, uh, Yammer and uh, Los Korea, uh, Los uh, West uh, Africa, and uh, Australia. As a working Bhutan, especially working in Bhutan, is uh, central to uh, Paul's interest in the uh, happiness, well being, and beyond GDP uh, agenda, which provides uh, uh, the fund foundation for his planet happiness. Uh, happiness, uh, uh, planet happiness uh, focuses on uh, the attention of all tourism stakeholders on the well-being agenda. To use uh, uh, tourism as a vehicle for development, the uh, uh, demonstrably uh, strengthening uh, uh, destination sustainable and uh, uh, quality of life for host communities. So. Uh, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Uh, Rogers. Great, wonderful. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Dr. Cheng Li. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, distinguished speakers. And thank you very much to uh, Professor Jafari and Professor Kazam for, for um, uh, organizing these wonderful events. Um, so here we go uh, with, with my presentation. Um, uh, uh, mountain tourism and community development lessons from the, the Himalayas. So uh, as Dr. Li Cheng mentioned, uh, I got into this work um, through a, a PhD focused on uh, Nima's uh, home, uh, home region, the, the Kumbu region, the South Mount Everest National Park. I first went there as a, as a tourist in 1989 and was really overcome by the enormity of the, the landscape and the concept that 
tourism is just going to bring so much change to this, this area. Um, and so I was fortunate to get accepted onto a PhD program. And basically the, the focus of the, the, the thesis, if you like, was uh, what is this concept of ecotourism? And is the Sega Martha National Park an, an example of ecotourism? So if we break that down into a, those two component questions, what is ecotourism? Well, it's a form of ecotourism uh, that has international definitions uh, that are formulated by the International Ecotourism Society, IUCN and, and others. And it's all about balancing development, really. It's economic development, it's uh, environmental protection, um, social cultural exchange and, and celebration between the tourists and the hosts and a, a learning be between the, the two. So then that second part of the question then, is the Sagamartha National Park an example of ecotourism? Well, I spent uh, a couple of years uh, living up in the mountains between 93 and, and 97. Um, and the conclusion of the PhD was uh, largely owing to those benefits that Nima has just been describing. Um, yes, it is an example, or it was an example in 1997 of ecotourism, but it wasn't a, an especially strong example owing to the extensive deforestation uh, on, the, on the boundaries of the park and also at high altitude where people were ripping the, the juniper out of the, the high alpine valleys for the, for the fuel wood to, to cook for the tourists. Um, there was also widespread littering, not just um, up on the mountain itself, but throughout the, the villages. The price increases that uh, Nima mentioned meant people couldn't afford uh, some, some low paid people, poor, poor households would not be able to afford uh, basic uh, items. And there was also some uh, conflict between uh, the villagers inside the park and, and outside the park uh, over the best ways to, to manage tourism and development issues. And fundamentally why um, an issue was, was the kind of weak and stressed management systems to be able to manage this rapid uh, change and growth uh, affecting the, the area. Now, shortly after I did that PhD, I was, uh, and 10 years uh, total of work in, in Nepal, um, in 2002, I was invited to go to Bhutan to, to look at their model of, of mountain tourism. Um, and so these two countries, you know, whilst they're both Himalayan, uh, it's a bit like comparing chalk and cheese, we say in the UK. They're, they're unlike, uh, dissimilar in many, many ways both in, in the, the, the size of the country, uh, the contrasts in the, in the different population, um, and in, in their approach to tourism development. Whereas Nepal uh, is very much open to all, site, all types of, of tourism. It has multiple markets and um, products and is very much um, changing uh, owing to the high demand for, for tourism. And that growth that you see uh, over the, the time period from 2002 to 2019. And if we contrast that with Bhutan, it's a much, much smaller country uh, with a far, far smaller population. Um, and the government there was very concerned when it was opening up for tourism because it didn't want to be overwhelmed by those same uh, high growth in, in visitor numbers. And so they've taken a much more controlled approach to tourism development, which they call high value, uh, low volume. They have a, a narrower range of, of, of products. Uh, tourism development is very much controlled by the government with its high uh, tariff. You have to spend uh, so much per day um, and, and that is all organized by the, by the tour operators who maintain uh, quite a lot of control over the industry in, in 2002 when I was there initially. Um, and so over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, we can see that tourism has grown, uh, but it's grown uh, at a much slower rate. And actually those numbers in 2002 didn't include the Indian tourists that aren't uh, obliged to pay this tariff. Um, and so more recently, they've embraced the Indian numbers in, in their overall figures. Now, um, 
more recently, I've had the pleasure of working in the far north of, of Myanmar, uh, in the Kakabaratsi National Park, where they would like to develop tourism. And up to this point, there has been little, if any, tourism. So the level of development uh, in the far north of, of Myanmar is, is very low in terms of quality education, in terms of roads, in, in terms of economic um, development. And in their intention to open up for tourism, I was asked to uh, take a group of community leaders uh, and government representatives to the Mount Everest National Park as, a, as an example of what might be achieved moving, moving forward. So there was a sort of more than 20 year gap between the start of my PhD and uh, this, this revisitation. And it was remarkable really to contrast the changes from 1993 uh, to, to um, just a couple of years ago. And besides that um, uh, economic benefit that Nima was describing, it was wonderful to see the, the regeneration of the forests outside the park that were being denuded. Um, it was wonderful to see the incredible work of the Sagamatha Pollution Control Committee engaged in waste management issues, not just in the base camp area, but in the valleys leading to up into the park. And then uh, with uh, the National Park Buffer Zone User um, or the Buffer Zone Policy, I should say, uh, user groups had been developed to manage the reforestation. Uh, women's groups were very much involved in, in um, aspects of community uh, development. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, many hydro plants had taken off throughout the region to wean people off the firewood um, and use hydroelectric pl plants. So the Everest region is an incredible example of community engagement in all aspects of their development, not just the economy, but in, um, in, in environment, in education, um, and so much more uh, besides with those types of employment that Nima was referring to. And I think the factors that underpin that, that great success is the investment in the schools and the healthcare that Nima uh, referred to. But we also need to look to the, to the World Heritage uh, status and the National Park rules and regulations. And in the last 20 or 30 years, I have yet to see another country that has such a forward-looking approach to National Park management by regenerating, recycling uh, 30 to 50 percent of the park income that comes from tourism development into local development uh, initiatives that are uh, proposed by the communities in those user groups, women's groups and, and so on. It's a, a wonderful model of, of high particip local participation and inclusivity. Now, if we uh, look look then to see what can be learned from Bhutan and from the Nepal. Well, from, from Bhutan, um, this gross national happiness agenda, I think is, is, is deeply profound. Uh, Anu in her uh, presentation talked about the need for tourism to support host community well-being, And it, when we look at sustainability criteria set out by the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, everybody, you know, lines up and says tourism development needs to support the well-being of host communities. So Bhutan has taught us how to define and measure this term well-being from an individual and a community uh, perspective. And so really at the, tour, at the destination level, tourism needs to, to develop and needs to be developed in a way that strengthens well-being and Bhutan can show us how to define and measure that. And in more recent uh, publications from UNWTO, this is another example of um, highest levels of, of um, uh, knowledge in the tourism sector, recognizing that tourism should support well-being and it needs to be inclusive to embrace all elements of the local community. And when we, when we look at Nepal, if we think about tourism planning and management, it involves all arms of government, it involves all arms of the private sector, and so uh, it, it's also a wonderful example of community engagement in tourism development, really quite profound. I would say it is one of the world's best examples of inclusive community development through tourism. So after 
you know, working in this space for 20 years, uh, three years ago, um, uh, it occurred to me that we can bring these elements to, together um, in, a, in, in bringing um, and starting, well, starting this project, Planet Happiness, the tourism and big data project of the Happiness Alliance. So I have a short video here, two and a half minute video that explains nicely what Planet Happiness is about. Can you hear that, all right? Yeah, yeah we can, we can see. Right. Yep. So that's a quick overview of, of what the project is about and how um, it's intended to, to bring communi communities and position them uh, front and centre in the tourism development and planning uh, process. So the conclusions I'd like to, to propose here are that recovering from COVID-19 to build back not just better but stronger and fitter, uh, tourism stakeholders need to recognise the imperative to value and measure tourism's, travel and tourism's contribution to both the individual and the destination well-being, and position local communities front and center. And I also believe that the world's highest national park uh, and world heritage site with its exceptional example of community engagement and inclusivity in tourism planning can be used as a model uh, to teach, replicate and celebrate inclusivity in community-based tourism and, and destination uh, management. So um, there we go, that's a, a quick overview there and uh, it's been a pleasure to, to be here and join you all today. Thank you. Okay. Oh, actually, so just one other thing, what I'll, <laughs> what I'll do is in the um, in the chat box there, I include a, a link to our happiness index survey and I invite everybody to, uh, to take it to learn more about our process and, and visit our website. Thanks, Dr. Cheng Li. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Thanks for your informative and also uh, provoking uh, uh, presentation for us. So I think that uh, it's very, very, very uh, amazing that uh, you did a lot of work in Bhutan, Nepal, and also Yammer, so this area. So 
uh, I think that we can learn a lot, lot of things from your example that tourism and mountain tourism development can listen from, from Bhutan. Uh, the gross national happiness that you mentioned, that it's, it's, uh, it's very, very important that um, how to look at uh, the, the happiness, the well-being, that uh, the, what, what is the quality of life in terms with the same meaning that you, you mentioned in your paper uh, presentation. And um, for your presentation that um, uh, 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 you see that uh, uh, Sagamata, uh, the uh, Everest the National Park tourism uh, key characteristics is uh, high local participation and uh, inclusivity. And uh, so can uh, the, uh, the other place can learn from this uh, uh, Everest the National Park and uh, inclusivity in importance of local institution and, and can help and uh, the community uh, can involved to develop. So moreover, uh, so uh, your, uh, your planted happiness to contribute to bring uh, uh, these lessons that, uh, together. That's great changing, of course, you mentioned that uh, the, the, the pa pandemic uh, impact that uh, was so the amazing, you did a lot of amazing practice will continue after the pandemic that uh, to, uh, for the, uh, uh, this uh, Himalayas mountain tourism. Uh, expect to see you more result for the uh, world. So uh, for the uh, time limitation, uh, I think that uh, we should, uh, uh, we should uh, go straight to the question and uh, answer uh, thinking. Uh, which is uh, supposed to be at uh, uh, half an hour, uh, I would like to, but I think that we have not enough time now. So I would like to ask two questions and uh, probably uh, one statement or one question is more of the uh, short term related to the community benefit. Uh, the first question uh, is uh, uh, how the communities can get the real and uh, a steady a benefit from the mountain tourism and uh, whether it has the replicability in other mountain tourism development area. Uh, this is my first question. And, uh, uh, and then the second question is about the cultural impact from mountain tourism in Himalayas. My second question is uh, how to look at the uh, cultural impact from the quickly development of mountain tourism in Himalayas. I want, I want to know uh, uh, from your uh, perspective, let me uh, start with same uh, consequence, uh, but, uh, but uh, perhaps I will, uh, I'd like to also uh, mix with Dr. Jeffrey and Dr. Kazam and, and uh, can join us discussion. Uh, the first, I will start with Dr. Uh, Alu Lama uh, about the, the questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alu Lama, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Um, thank you for these questions. Um, um, but to the first question, you know, regards to the benefits from the the real benefits as well as the steady benefits, right? I want to really unpack these two words. When I say real, you know, this is something that really matters in a sense that, you know, the equitable benefit sharing, right? Whatever happens, because the host as such has a lot to lose when you are exposed to, you know, a sudden surge in the demand, like, you know, and so there is a lot to lose, right? But then the immediate benefit to it is right, how are they benefiting, especially, and that's why when you're seeing a real, it's like are the communities able to gain, especially in a monetary terms, as well as from the social and environmental terms. But when you're saying steady, then there lies the bigger question of the long-term sustainability, right? So um, many a times what happens is that, you know, um, when, and, and I can already see from the examples what Dr. Nima was saying, right? Every destination has this whole life cycle model. In the early phase, everybody is getting benefits. There is an excitement and all. But as and when the impact starts, you know, increasing, then it's nobody's business. And so that the whole question of steady should be very much looked from the collaborative perspective. That is where the regulation aspects, policy aspects, investment, right? All these come into play. So there is, in terms of a steady, 
you need to form a strong collaborations. And that's why when I say it's, it's no longer PPP, like public private, but it should be public private and community partnership model, right? All these key players should take uh, and then manage it. And I think that is a way in which you can really see the real impact as well as the steady impact of the business that happens at the community level. Now, coming back to the impacts on the culture, like, you know, how you could really look at it. Um, this is a quite a, a tricky situation in the sense that, you know, all the, like we human beings are social animals, right? Uh, we are not immune to any kind of influences once you are interacting with the other engagement, uh, other people from the other cultural background. Now, what is more important here is that we are talking about the remote mountains and the communities. Many at times, like if I give an example of the sites where EC mode was, like Dr. Paul Roger was mentioning about Myanmar or like the one we talked about, uh, the Hanlong and all. These are the communities that are not very much advanced or exposed to the outside, right? The, the vulnerability and susceptibility of them to be influenced culturally is even more uh, great. But then it, it will never, it, it is not always in a negative sense. How would you understand this whole aspects of cultural influence? It depends upon how much of the awareness are you able to create to the communities and what are, we, are you preserving the traditions? Are you really also maintaining the heritage? Because, you know, some of the sites of cultural importance, natural importance, there has a direct physical impacts also. So, you know, try, the cultural influence is quite a dynamic concept. So you need to really look from how you are managing the infrastructure assets, the psychological aspects, the awareness, right? So these are the things I, I can think about, you know, when you say, you know, how to ensure, you know, the cultures are, um, I mean, you know, to ensure how the cultures are not negatively impacted and how you can really, um, you know, uh, make the benefits uh, um, best out of the interaction that happens within the you know, different cultures through tourism. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Alulama. Uh, so what's your take, uh, uh, take uh, Dr. Niu Yong, what's your take on this? Dr. Niu Yong. Dr. Liu Yong, maybe something wrong. So I, I have to move to Dr. Lima Shiba. Uh, what's your take on this? Oh, well, um, so like the, the advantage and disadvantages of, you know, the mountain tourism in a specific region, for example, like I'm um, very specific to Mount Everest region where I come from. So we had both the pros and cons, you know. So, well, if you look at the immediate benefits, well, the community in the region have definitely benefited a lot in terms of the monetary value of the economic de developments due to which, and also there's been a lot of uh, development in the community level. You know, like uh, earlier Dr. Paul was saying about, there's a lot of um, active community participation or in the development of the region. And I think we learned that from being exposed to the Western world as well, you know, so more and more people come, started to come in and they started giving ideas. And then that's where we learn. Like, for example, I think Everest region, the people in the Everest region has a lot of awareness about keeping the environment clean. You know, I think it was, we learned from the tourists, but now we have a lot of migrant workers from other parts of Nepal coming to work in the region that also, you know, like they literally, the trails, so the porters are not from the Kumbu region. They're all from the other parts of Nepal, especially the lower Solo Kumbu Valley. And they still don't have the awareness of, you know, like um, keeping, the, keeping the air clean. So if you look on the trail, so wherever the porters stop, you know, there's like a specific porter place where porters stop for a break. That's where you can see all the plastic um, packs and everything that they eat and they just uh, it away but the local people in the region is actually now they don't they hesitate to like throw away plastic um bottles or maybe you know whatever they use they at least take away or either they know how to uh, they were disposed in a right place but for me the other concern is about um the cultural and the the social traditional impacts um, brought upon by the 
economic development brought up, up by the mountain tourism. So in the Kumbu Valley, if you look now, so you know we're losing the cultural, cultural and traditional values like I was mentioning earlier. With the economic development, people have the capacity to spend, you know, like uh, send their children abroad, uh, like um, to better uh, schools or maybe um, better cities. So the migration and the immigration thing is taking place. So imagine if in the Kumbu Valley where everyone becomes, you know, prosperous, there would be nobody in the Kumbu Valley. Everyone who can afford, they're sending their kids to school, Kathmandu, uh, or they're moving to Kathmandu. So it's become very seasonal. So most of the people that can afford from the, from the Kumbu Valley, they spend, they have, they, they spend most of the time in Kathmandu and they go back to the village only for the seasonal job, like running a tea house or maybe running their business. So I think it has both. So right now in the Kumbu Valley in our, our region, the majority of people that are staying back is either one is the, the older generation, like my parents, they are like they want to be in the villages, but my generation, if you can afford, everyone is moving out of the village. So I will, I, I'm already out of the scene. So how do we manage? How do you, you know, like retain people like from our generation to go back and can, you know, continue what our grandfathers and fathers, you know, they did. So that's a, I think it's a, of a major concern. Like earlier, Dr. Liu was talking about the Sikuniang. I've been there. So now since tourists started to come in, the families, you know, started earning money. Now they started sending children to Chengdu for studies, for example. So if the, then the children will settle in Chengdu or maybe in the bigger cities and then they hesitate to go back. So what remains in the, in the region is only one generation of people um, before that generation. And when it's, so that's a major concern I see from the, you know, like uh, the impact of mountain tourism. Well, it has both, you know, like economic, economy wise, it helps to elevate the poverty level drastically, definitely. But when people start, you know, like they have money and then they have opportunity, people hesitate to just, you know, get stuck somewhere just because you think, um, think of the cultural uh, of the other values. So I think it's human nature for us. Like, so when there is an opportunity, you want to take it. So that's an, I'm an example of what happened because of the mountain tourism. Before. So uh, I don't know how to put this forward, but you know, like um, it has both the pros and cons. It brings everything. So in our region, you know, one mountain changed everything. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lima. And uh, you are local people and uh, young generation of Sherpa. And so I hope that uh, in future, you can do a lot of things for your, for your, for your Sherpa people, Sherpa uh, community. So before I come to Dr. Jeffrey and uh, Dr. Cousin, uh, uh, Dr. Liu Yong, uh, what's your pick? Can you answer my two questions? Dr. Liu Yong, come back. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, my uh, <coughs> my Wi-Fi has a little trouble just now. Uh, Good snow. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nima is my uh, good friend. We used to <laughs> meet in Chengdu. And uh, I used to work uh, as a mountain guide for many years in uh, Himalaya region, uh, both in Chinese side and uh, uh, Nepal side. Uh, I found a, 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 a very interesting place is uh, back to 19, uh, 2014 or 2013. I was in a, a valley. We climbed, uh, I forgot the name. Uh, it's come to my mind uh, quickly. Uh, it's not a side of Kungu Valley. We climbed a mountain called uh, Bamango. It's not a side uh, of uh, uh, Mount Everest. Uh, when we hike uh, hike up in that place, it's really far away. If we want to get to the mountain, it's about five or seven days hike there. And uh, we we found there's a monastery, and uh, there's uh, only one school in the monastery. I talked with the Lama there, and uh, the Lama told me uh, in this school it has all the uh, almost all the children from this valley. It was like only twenty of them. Uh, 
I didn't really see a lot of uh, young people in this valley. Uh, and I, I climbed that mountain with one of my friends. Uh, uh, it's, his name is, um, he's famous Sharpa right now. Uh, Min Ma Ji, Min Ma Ji Sharpa. Uh, we did this on climb peak uh, in a few days. Uh, and then I stayed in his uh, father's house. He, his father was the first generation who was porter, uh, who climbed with uh, uh, Chris Bonington or those very famous climbers. And uh, he told me, he said uh, his father used to uh, live in uh, Kathmandu then. He moved back to his home. It's this place called Na, very high, like uh, four thousand meters uh, high. It's it's really hard uh, condition there. And, but the old people like to stay in the uh, in the valley. But the, uh, most of the young people they move to Kathmandu. Uh, Neem, uh, uh, Sherpas bought their land. They built a uh, house there, and wow. they never get back to their uh, valley again. This is quite a difference with uh, what I found in here in the Chinese side, the Sigunya area, Very because uh, uh, I follow this uh, mountain nearing, uh, this uh, mountain tourism uh, industry uh, development for over 28 years. Uh, when I was there, uh, back to uh, early 1990s, they have very, very small house and uh, the road was really bad and uh, uh, people are poor. They, they didn't even brush their tooth because they don't ha uh, have uh, clean waters. And uh, the, the, the only industry there is uh, agriculture uh, and a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, normal. Uh, but after the mountain tourism in, uh, increased, uh, improved there, uh, you can see uh, a lot of uh, mountain to uh, to uh, tourists come from the big city. And those people, uh, uh, highly educated and uh, uh, they have a, a pretty good income. So they spend uh, a lot of money there and uh, uh, shortly the locals uh, find out uh, their love and the like uh, because these people come with uh, respect of their local cultures. This is what we want to see. They come to the mountains for the nature. They all also, they want to see the uh, local religions, their, their culture elements. So uh, it reminds, uh, it's encouraged local people to have a confidence of their culture. And uh, they start to build a new house with uh, the Tibetan style house, but uh, very good uh, living condition inside. They have a hot shower, uh, they have a very clean uh, toilet and uh, they start to eat uh, food from outside. And uh, from the uh, guest and host uh, interaction, they got a lot of uh, information from outside. And then they, they know uh, what a city looks like, what the city life looks like. And uh, they realized uh, they should send their uh, kids to the big city to, uh, to get a better education. Uh, and they have money as, as well because uh, they make money from their tourism. So they sent the kids to, uh, to the city and uh, a lot of the old, old people worry about the uh, kids that were, they would never uh, get back to the mountain. Um, uh, you know, uh, in China, uh, the government is very powerful. Um, when they found uh, this place is, uh, is really good, attractive for the tourists. And uh, also the mountain tourism is very, very uh, useful. Uh, to, to reduce the uh, uh, poverty for the local people. The government uh, start to build the uh, highway uh, from the big city to there. Uh, as soon as the highway finished, uh, it's get more convenient for more tourists uh, to go there. And uh, uh, this, uh, the facilities, it's getting much, much better than before. So if you go to Sigunyan town right now, you, you gotta see beautiful hotels and a lot of uh, good restaurants and uh, the living condition really increased uh, really high. I mean, uh, it's like a uh, Switzerland uh, there. And then it's attracted, attracted a lot of the young kids, the local kids come back to this area to run in their own uh, family business. Uh, because in the big city, urban city, it's uh, now very, very hard to, to, to find the job uh, opportunities there. And uh, also they can make uh, uh, good um, uh, money when they're back home and uh, uh, science the, uh, 
the internet uh, improved in China, the information oh, and yeah. uh, all these uh, uh, all these resources become more uh, easily to get from outside. Uh, I think uh, to yeah, I to give these uh, local communities uh, benefits, the best uh, way is uh, first of all you have to build this uh, really good uh, road to there. Uh, that's what happened in Nepal. Uh, because I, I used to work in Nepal for over 15 years uh, for, as a Himalaya guide. Uh, the problem is the road. If you want to go to the, the, the valley, you, you got to drive like um, eight, nine hours to this area, which is only 200 kilometers there. Um, if, you, if you come to this site in uh, Himalaya, you, you got to say uh, they have a road everywhere to the village, to the small, uh, even small community village. Uh, as soon as the road finished, uh, the whole uh, uh, industry uh, improved very much. But also, uh, it has uh, uh, the uh, lective uh, side as well. Uh, this is uh, very common in uh, normal tourism because uh, uh, people from everywhere they they, they brought a lot of uh, bad habits from the city, uh, and then. Uh, locals start to learn a lot of the bad things from the city like uh, they start to they start to do gambling you know and uh, uh, for uh, they want to better business and they start to do a, a hard competition there and the uh, cheating you know because uh, uh, tourism also uh, damage the, the the tradition there um, but a very interesting uh, view from my research was uh, uh, from mountain tourism you can uh, you can see uh, uh, we have a much more uh, positive side uh, than the negative effect. Uh, we're still do we're st uh, still doing this research right now. Um, uh, well, I th I think this is what I think. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Doctor Liu Yong. So, uh, Doctor Jeffrey. Do you, oh. Can you give some uh, comment and, uh, from I, your side? Do I get to, do I get to respond uh, first? Sorry for jumping in. Uh, <laughs> Paul. Or does it go to Dr. Jafari? Sorry. I'd Should... like to invite uh, Dr. Jafari uh, can that, give some Dr. Tony, uh, we still have a Paul Rogers. Yes, Paul. Those are... Uh, we, we are waiting for Paul too. Uh, uh, okay, fa fa thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, I would say, yeah, to ensure benefits for communities, as Dr. Yu was mentioning there, the access is critical. Um, but equally, uh, and perhaps more profoundly, uh, I think there has to be a focus on schools and education that, that Nima mentioned. It is. It is the opportunity for local communities to get a good education that allows them access to, to business uh, thinking or to become uh, civil you know, public servants, if we, if we say, or national park managers. So the education for local communities is, is fundamental. Okay. Um, and then uh, I, we need to put communities front and center. Uh, I would say, and our approach with this happiness index, uh, we can deploy the survey through the local communities. They can get scorecards to compare their individual well-being with all other survey takers. So they start to think about what well-being means. And when we use this term well-being, it is synonymous with happiness and quality of life. We're measuring people's quality of life. And just as we measure individual quality of life, we can measure the quality of life of communities. And important to this is with the scorecards across the domains, we can stack them from low to high. So we can see where communities are thriving and we can see where their deficiencies are. And then we can use the data and local stories about what interventions uh, need to be developed to increase those deficient areas of quality of life, of well-being. And then we can look to engage communities in decision-making of what interventions are needed 
those interventions can be um, you know, in, in implemented. And then we redeploy the survey a year or every other year to see what the impact of uh, those interventions and general development is having on the, on the community. Each destination has its own URL, so we can include one or two other questions or a small number of questions in there to focus on uh, local development issues that need to be strengthened. So by working in this way, building in these quality of life measures and reflecting on those, engaging the communities in the conversations uh, as the development unfolds over years and decades, uh, we can ensure that the focus is on local communities and meeting their, their needs. Um, then with regard to the, uh, the cultural impact, uh, yeah, culture is not static. Uh, it, it, um, it is always changing. But again, in the survey we have, it focuses questions on, on culture and on um, uh, elements of, of, of the celebration of culture and, and what it's composed of. Um, and then only by engaging communities to give them thoughts, ideas, suggestions and uh, on what can be done to, to celebrate, conserve and uh, respect their, their heritage, it comes out in these conversations that the, the data we have um, in, inspires. And not only is this approach appropriate to mountain environments, it's, a, it's appropriate to, to cities and, and other uh, destinations as well. And so we can compare the results of mountain communities with with uh, urban communities and I think it's the connection of people to the land that is fundamental to the well-being of, of uh, communities and of uh, people's relationship with the planet. We, we need to get away from extraction and go back towards regeneration and it is the close relationships that mountain communities have with the land, with their culture, that are very important lessons for the, for the planet moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. So, uh, Dr. Jeffrey, do you want to link it with some uh, uh, opinion uh, from your side? Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, for engineering such a wonderful uh, panel presentation and discussion. I wish uh, it was a much longer, uh, much longer in duration. A lot of issues came up, and uh, I, as one, learned a lot. Uh, it's very hard to summarize these almost two hours um, exchanges. Um, but if I make my own conclusion, uh, this uh, uh, webinar can be uh, summarized uh, in two key areas uh, that uh, tourism is about uh, climate change and tourism about culture change. Uh, climate change was not the subject of this webinar. Uh, climate change, uh, culture change received all the attention. And I, as uh, an anthropologist, and I know Lee is an anthropologist also, uh, believe that culture change comes first if we are going to control climate change. Uh, but that's a debate between the soft and hard science and uh, the hard science has the upper hand, and I hope they succeed in, the, in climate change issues, but I again insist that climate change has to be, uh, culture change has to, has to come first. Uh, and the change that we talk about in this webinar uh, uh, is about change for better or for worse. And we got plenty of examples about that. Uh, I'm also very happy to hear that uh, with, with the last commentary from Paul Rogers that uh, we can also engineer happiness. Um, that would be a very hard task and it seems that you are, you are on the top of the subject. Uh, and happiness, unfortunately or fortunately has its own definition, who is defining happiness? In what sense we are defining happiness? Are the people of the villages uh, who uh, seem to have more income or they have more income, are, do they seem really happier or are they really happy? Uh, uh, as one or two of the panelists mentioned, are we able to 
take them back to their own village, that they basically tourism allowed them to become a different person, uh, seeking to go to a different place. Uh, so uh, tourism creates a lot of challenges, uh, both opportunities and costs. Unfortunately, in this webinar, we talked about both opportunities and costs. So uh, Dr. Lee, uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, classroom, I better call it, or workshop. Uh, we learned a lot. Uh, I think I, I can speak about uh, the audience, which still remains more, uh, which is still more than 120 person strong uh, at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, webinar. And I'm, I'm sure Hazem is going to tell us uh, tell us about the webinar series as well. And by the way, uh, Kazem is one of those people who can tell you how to bring people back to their villages. And I, I know he's doing that in Japan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. So Dr. Kazem, would you like to add something? Sorry, as well, I was muted. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, and uh, all the speakers, uh, Dr. Liu, um, Rogers, um, Anu, and uh, Nima. I personally uh, uh, learned a lot. Um, as uh, Professor Jafari mentioned, I've been working with a rural area in Japan and some other uh, places in the world, but uh, today I learned a lot of lessons. I've been um, in, um, touch with some of the cases in this uh, region, but uh, haven't been able to visit. Uh, but uh, today, uh, my um, quality of information raised a lot. I uh, could feel that I visit the place. So I, I, I saw a really, a, a really good uh, symphony. So uh, it included um, the development. Uh, so Dr. Liu's um, example of roads and the train that make me a bit worried uh, because it shows the dominant of human uh, over the nature. And the other side, which um, Nima and, and Anu, they, they talk about the community and the community-based uh, tourism and efforts that how they should survive. I got some comments from uh, my former students from this region that they, they shared the stories that they, uh, they left the place Sherpas, they send their kids to uh, other places. If I remember, um, maybe um, um, Katamandu, somewhere um, in the, uh, if I pronounce well. And they stay in a dormitory and when they uh, are educated, they do not want to go back to the place. And uh, that's uh, the beginning of uh, moving out and, and the, we lose the community. But, uh, um, I like uh, also the way Dr. Uh, Rogers uh, measure the happiness and wellness together. So, but um, also I'm wondering how we are using it. So this measurement uh, is producing tools, but um, it produced knowledge, but uh, in how or in what extent the knowledge is useful and is a tool in the hands of uh, local community to empower them as well. Um, uh, these are the stories that we are uh, sharing from fragile environments. Um, of course, we are not talking about climate change, but um, it is impacting, it is affecting the life of the people there. And because their uh, place is more sensitive to these changes, um, we need to think that uh, how we can uh, create more uh, sustainability and resiliency. Uh, and um, if I uh, summarize every uh, uh, thing in my mind in a few words, I would say uh, we should uh, think of a, a model uh, sustainable livelihoods uh, for the people who are living there that, uh, uh, and it should be more attractive than alternative livelihoods that they can seek, or they can uh, go for it. So uh, the livelihood uh, should be realistic, and it should consider the changes because we can't uh, we can't close our eyes. The new generation they they want uh, 
uh, new technologies and new lifestyle and so on, but how to combine the traditional livelihood uh, and how to uh, keep people uh, uh, to, to take care of their values on their own is, uh, is the issue. Uh, again, thank you very much. It went very beyond the time. Still over hundred people are here. Uh, I got a few uh, excellent videos to show uh, with you. I'm going to uh, play it at the end when, when we say bye-bye. And uh, those who can, uh, they, they uh, stay here, they can watch it or they can uh, watch it on YouTube later. Yeah. Uh, what I want to show uh, and share is the Scott itself. So as, uh, as you uh, probably uh, already uh, found us here, um, and registered for this webinar. Uh, we are doing this uh, webinar series every month, uh, one in English and one in another languages. And if you go for the future webinars, uh, you see the list of upcoming webinars uh, that is uh, in the list. And please uh, join us. We are uh, looking uh, to meet you again in the future webinars. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I wish you a pleasant uh, rest of uh, weekends. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to uh, uh, continue with the video uh, that we received from the uh, panelists. So thank you, thank you, uh, Kazan. Uh, so uh, so uh, maybe uh, we have not, not enough time to uh, whether I can continue to give the final round to everyone to address Something, cousin? Yes, please, yes. Okay, I will give the final round to everyone, uh, 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 speakers, uh, to his, uh, with only one minute, only one minute. We have not enough time to each speaker express your uh, expectation and the vision for Himalaya mountain tourism. Uh, or, or what practice, uh, practical work that you are planning to do for community involvement in the development. Okay, so uh, the first, uh, Dr. Alu Lama. Uh, definitely, I would like to focus on, again, I would like to reflect back to what Professor Zafri was saying. I would like to bring the unheard and marginalized voices right in center in a sense, because this is going to be the year of the mountain, precisely because now with the COVID, right? Now there is a lot of attractions that people are going to now throng in the mountain, primarily because of the wellness reasons and for health reasons. And also mountain is going to be one of the most important, uh, you know, centers in the coming decades when it comes to tourism. So definitely we, you know, that focusing on the community and empowering them, especially from an enterprise perspective. So that's the thing that I am very much looking forward to and committed about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alu. So how about you, uh, Liu Yong? Oh, I have a just short sentence. The mountain is uh, where we come from and a mountain is uh, where our soul goes back and uh, uh, go visit mountain, but uh, just bring the uh, memory back to your urban community, uh, respect of the mountain. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Nima. Well, me now, I know, I have, I wear many hats so from a village boy to a clinician to an expedition doctor to now an, an ent entrepreneur. So my goal for the next few years would be, you know, to create job opportunities, to create employment as much as I can so that it can benefit the people in the local community because we've had a hard time in the last two years because of the pandemic. Okay. And thank you. I'll thank think you. About that next. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nima. So Dr. Uh, Paul Rogers, last Thanks. one. Uh, firstly, I'd, I have two things. Firstly, our Planet Happiness Partnership with the Himalayan Trust to uh, deploy the survey uh, in the Kumbu region uh, recently won an international Our World Heritage uh, Award. So we're currently trying to raise a small amount of funding. Uh, 
$15,000 to deploy the survey in the Everest region and the results of this work uh, will be celebrated next year at the, um, uh, at the World Heritage uh, co co Convention celebrations marking the, the 50th anniversary of, of UNESCO's World Heritage con Convention. So uh, we're very keen to, to profile this story um, in, in that meeting of the World Heritage Committee. Secondly, uh, in 10 days time, uh, we have an invitation only high level webinar uh, convened with uh, the leaders of um, uh, tourism from the World Bank Group and from the World Economic Forum, uh, the World Travel and Tourism Council and, and many others to look at this proposition of the imperative to, to value and measure uh, tourism's contribution to individual and destination well-being. So um, if that meeting goes well and we get that international policy level recommendation, then we will be taking this agenda uh, forward uh, through a global communication strategy um, in, the, in the months and, and years ahead. So uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed to, for, for that and do keep in touch. We'll have some more news to share on that in, in around 10 days, two weeks time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul uh, Rogers. Um, well, uh, we have not enough time. Uh, I think that we are going to the last the conclusion. Well, uh, certainly indeed, as, as we discussed, uh, the mountain tourism today is actually, I think that uh, uh, it gave me uh, all of your presentation uh, messages, give me a new uh, angle to look at the, the mountain tourism. From my side, maybe I think that how to, how to research how to help and how to improve the mountain tourism in Himalaya area. And how to look at this, of course, it was very important to look at the, the, the happiness, the well-being, and of course, the sustainability of mountain tourism. Well, uh, we have, uh, I think that uh, lots of things uh, uh, to talk and to discuss in the future, I believe. I will give the floor to Dr. Jeffrey, uh, to close the session. So, Dr. Jeffrey. Well, I don't have much to add uh, except saying that uh, uh, definitely we have a lot uh, ahead of us to do. Uh, the challenges and opportunities uh, well uh, spelled out quite well uh, at this webinar. Uh, and I always uh, have this question and I want to answer it myself. Uh, tourism for whom? Why do we do tourism? My answer is tourism for the community, for the local community, for the benefit of local community. So if tourism is for the tourist, I don't think that's what I, I would like to support. Uh, of course, the tourists are, are expected to enjoy. But at the end of analysis, at the end of the day, it's the community that matters, it's the people that matters, the culture uh, that is matter. And uh, I hope the culture is not the loser at the end of the game with culture change. Um, we have a lot ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaffa Jaffrey. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah, great. Thank Thank to see you, you in the future. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, good to meet all of you. Have a good day. Bye. Good day. Thank you. Bye. bye.